Lawrence. The only thing I could tell them, which they already knew, was the position of the company or administration or personnel. I could tell them that. Atomic weapons and where, th I know they're there, but where they're at, I didn't know. The interrogation went for quite a while. Then they realized, oh, it's true. He wasn't there long enough to know it. As hellish as North Korea looks from the outside to folks now, the demonization of the place back then was so complete that to to make that leap was just, it's, it's inconceivable. North Korea was viewed by the U.S. as a puppet of the Soviet Union. The country was led by a revolutionary who was committed to reunifying Korea by force if necessary. Here he was known and revered as Comrade Kim Il-sung, the great leader. His presence was everywhere. Kim Il-sung declared that the U.S. was the illegal occupier of South Korea and the sworn enemy of the Korean people. Dresnok was isolated and in the hands of a people unswerving in their hatred of the U.S. He was surrounded by anti-American imagery. Nothing here resembled the life he had left behind. Dresnok, Dresnok, who in the hell's calling me? I, oh my, I didn't believe myself. I shut them again, I must be dreaming. I opened them again and looked and, who in the hell are you? He says, I'm Absher. Absher? I don't know no Absher. He says, Larry Allen Absher. You didn't see in the newspapers? Oh, yes, now I remember. Absher grew up with family problems, simmered mild. But the elder people that were taking care of him supported him very good. He had a little trouble in South Korea with marijuana. He was caught on it five or six times. He always had VD. They were gonna court-martial him or kick him out of the army. He was fed up with the social life too, I guess. Instead of going back to his old life, he'd just come over to the DPRK. Private Absher's defection in May 1962 was the first by an American since the Korean War. Three months later, he was joined by Private First Class Dresnok. Embarrassingly for the U.S. Army, the two men became minor celebrities in North Korea. But even worse was to follow in December 1963 when Specialist 4 Jerry Wayne Parrish from Henderson, Kentucky simply disappeared from a routine border patrol. Parrish, he had family problems too. He had a stepfather which was an alcoholic. He always beat the mother and the children. And the stepfather thought he was having sexual relation with his stepsister, which was, he said, a lie. And he told me if I ever come home, he'd kill him. I figure he got the information on Absher and myself crossing over. And he said, well, if they're happy, I guess he could be happy too. Three GIs had now defected to the communists in 18 months. Publicly, the U.S. Army absolved itself of responsibility for these defections. These men were low-ranking soldiers from poor backgrounds and broken homes who had been unable to adapt to life in the military. But the North Koreans saw an opportunity. With each defection, they had acquired a higher rank. Their military council now raised the stakes, proclaiming that financial rewards awaited those willing to bring weapons and information over. In January 1965, Sergeant Charles Robert Jenkins, a non-commissioned officer from Rich Square, North Carolina, abandoned the nighttime patrol he was leading and took his M14 rifle to North Korea.
The North Koreans could never have imagined that four soldiers of the hated imperialist enemy would voluntarily and separately cross to their side in such a short period of time. The defection of an officer was presented to the North Korean population as proof of communism's superiority over U.S. imperialism. When I seen Jenkins in the newspaper the first time, I said, now why does an old sergeant like him come to North Korea? He looked like a grandfather. His wrinkles were deep from the time he was young. And come to find out, he wasn't but a year older than myself. By deserting the army, all four men had, whether they intended to or not, signed up to the communist cause. Their decision to defect may have been taken spontaneously, but the act was irreversible. But what could these Americans, who had all dropped out of high school, possibly contribute to the socialist revolution? These were people that were golden gifts to the North Koreans uh, by uh, blowing them up uh, as if, you know, these were people who saw the light and wanted to live under the mantle of Kim Il-sung's leadership. The U.S. government, I think, was very sensitive about this. They did not want publicity on these guys, and they still don't. I mean, I don't think now it's a conscious thing, but in the 60s, I think it was quite conscious to play down and hide these defections because they were, they were more embarrassing to the United States than you might think. We could hear the loudspeakers with Dreznov talking. It was absolutely appalling that he would do this and turn on the whole United States Army. Good morning, Nathan, Ninth Cab. Come over to North Korea, we'll give you everything. You know, we'll give you money, we'll give you women, you'll have everything. Every day or every week, we would hear him. He was telling us, you know, he had a lot of girls, you know, and they were treating him like royalty. And we knew it was lies. But the younger kids that just got out of basic and they were 18, really took it for heart. And we were afraid that some of them might actually say, hey, this is a good life, let's go over. The defectors became integral cogs in a propaganda machine, producing a barrage of anti-US material that was sent across the DMZ to GIs in the South. It was obviously somebody had written that script for him. He was uh, putting on a real line of shit. He found, he found La La Land. The communists, the North Koreans, would use people for what they could get out of them. I'm no smarter than any other soldier, but I was smart enough to know going there wasn't the answer. All you were going to do is be a slave. We took great pride in it. If the people look at it with the sunshades off, they say, oh, it's really true. <laughs> 